Well, I'm Charles Roeder. Thank you very much for today. We're going to talk a bit about seismic, mainly about seismic retrofit of brace frames. And uh, I'd like to acknowledge the uh, where we got the funding for we've had from this. We've had this. We've been working on this research for approximately uh, 15, 16 years, I believe. When was it's moving on its own? How's it doing that? We've, we've been working on this for a number of years, and we've had funding from three different projects of the National Science Foundation. We received a lot of funding from AISC, largely through Tom. Go back. And uh, as we've had a lot of donations of materials. So there's been quite a, lot, a substantial amount of analytical research. We worked with Casey Tsai at uh, Taiwan University. This on some kind of timer. Uh, and uh, no, he's helped us a great deal and provided a great deal of support for this work. Don Lehman and I are going to talk credit for all the work today done today, but these are the people that actually did the work. There are about 15 students I think we've had working on this project and received degrees on this particular work. <clears throat> so with our presentation today, we're going to talk about an overview of what we've done on this research with a focus primarily on seismic retrofit. So we're going to give a brief review of the current brace frame design practice, some concerned uh, summary of the uh, limitations and of, of current get back there. <clears throat> How do I get it off timer? Anyway, I'll give a summary of the deficiencies in existing systems, a discussion of our experimental research, then uh, talking about some of the consequences and retrofit strategies, and talking a bit about uh, the AISC 342 provisions, and uh, do some comparison through analysis. <clears throat> So I'm going to summarize the current practice. And uh, when we design brace frames and we do all seismic design, as you probably well know, we're designing at different levels. On the lower one level, we're designing it for serviceability. We make sure that our structure remains serviceable during small, frequent earthquakes with virtually no damage during wind loads and things of this type. During intermediate earthquakes that may occur, let's say, once every 500 years, we're willing to tolerate inelastic deformation of the structure. But we expect that the structure is going to be repairable and going to be um, almost immediately usable after the earthquake is over. But during very, very extreme earthquakes, and in the United States we're talking about an earthquake at something like 2,500 years, we, want a lot, we expect a lot of inelastic deformation. And the, the, earth, the structure may not be at all useful after this earthquake. But fortunately, 2,500 years doesn't occur very often. And so therefore, we feel that at this point, we can allow this inelastic damage. We don't want people to die. We don't want buildings to collapse. And so that's our goal. The way we deal with this is we have different levels of seismic design. We have special concentrically braced frames, which have a relatively high value of R. And by, by that, we mean we use a relatively small de seismic design forces. But we have very significant capacity-based design requirements, detailing requirements. Ordinary concentrically braced frames, we use a much smaller seismic force, but we have somewhat less restrictive capacity-based design requirements. There is an R equal to 3 design provision, which is very limited in its use. It's mainly used in less seismically active regions, which it, it's limited. We cannot use it on the West Coast, but really it's intended to, it's not focused on the capacity-based design requirements. When we talk about brace behavior, we're focused on the brace. And this slide is, is emphasizing what the brace does. If you look in the upper right, you see a brace. If you subject that brace to compression, eventually it buckles. Now, when a brace buckles, it doesn't collapse into a pile of rubble. What happens is, is the axial load capacity is limited at that point, and the brace starts to deform, as you see in the upper right. And when the brace starts to deform, it's developing P delta moments in the column. So after brace buckling, the brace may actually go through slightly larger increased loads, but as it's doing this, it's developing bending moments. And the bending moments develop in the middle of the brace, and it develops a plastic hinge. So it forms a kink in the plastic hinge, in the middle of the brace, as we see in that slide. And this is what's happened. When this happens, the brace starts to lose compressive load capacity, because with the combination of bending moment and axial load, we've exceeded the material capacity of the brace. So buckling capacity, the compressive capacity reduces. And so we get into post-buckling region. 
the brake's going to go through quite a lot of deformation. It's supporting compressive load, but the compressive load is getting smaller. Well, earthquakes have a ch tendency to change direction, and when they change directions, you need to straighten this brace out that's quite crooked. And we do this with a paper clip from time to time. You never perfectly straighten that brace out again. So it takes quite a large deformation to straighten the brace out. And when you get it straightened out, it's never quite as straight as it was before. So in multiple cycles, the compressive load is smaller and smaller. And so the consequence of this is the compressive load is deteriorating. Well, when you see this behavior, you see that the tensile brace and the compressive brace are different. And so as a consequence, when we do brace frames, we match these braces in pair. So we have a tensile brace and a compressive brace. Uh, so the consequence of all this is, is that the effect the effective behavior of these braces. And the thing that ultimately is going to fail is in the brace. The brace goes through large deformations, as you see on the left there, and those large deformations cause a high concentration of strain in the middle of the brace. And as a consequence, when you go through multiple cycles, eventually the brace fractures, as you see in the right-hand slide. So it's that behavior that we are really designing for when we design for brace frames. We want to control that buckling behavior. We want to ensure the brace fracture doesn't occur too soon. <clears throat> so as a consequence, we have a lot of detailing requirements for specially concentrically braced frames, SCBFs, that we need to satisfy do for doing this. And this slide is really summarizing these. We have we would have capacity-based design requirements so that we design our connections for the expected capacity of the brace. Not what we designed for, not the force that you designed the brace for, but for what the brace will actually deliver in the course of the earthquake. We have limitations on bracing configuration. For chevron braces, we have a limitation because one brace is in compression, one brace is in tension. The compressive force and the tensile force are different. There's an unbalanced force there that we have to deal with. And so we have to design for that unbalanced force. Some bracing configurations, like K bracing, which intersect in the column, are limited. We have slenderness limits for various brace sizes, both global limits and uh, and limits and uh, local limits. We have look, requirements for gusset plate requirements, and in particular, we have clearance requirements that allow the brace to buckle and form its full buckling deformation. And so we have all of these requirements that we have to satisfy. It makes brace frame design actually, it appears to be fairly simple, but it turns out to be one of the more complicated designs we have. So, but this has not always been the case. If you go back to prior to 1998, 1988, none of this was done. And so one of the things that we have done with our brace frame designs is we've looked at brace frames built in seismically active regions in the United States prior to 1988 and said, what, have, what do they look like compared to our current provisions? And we find that there's some fairly se severe deficiencies. <clears throat> So we've taken these, uh, we've examined 13 brace frames from seismically active regions of the United States, and we evaluated them in great detail and saying, how do they compare to what we think we need today for seismic behavior? And uh, these are the locations we've seen. There were six from California, three from Washington, and a num number of other locations. I think there were 13 of these frames. In doing this, we find that... <clears throat> Some limitations seem to be very, very common. One thing that we find is that there are a wide range of connections in valuating connections. Today, that there seems to be more standardization in our connections we use in seismic design, but the connections then varied widely. These are eight or just some of the ones that we've seen from this particular survey. Another thing that we saw is that chevron brace frames were almost universally used prior to 1988. Today, they're almost never used because we have that requirement of designing the beam for the unbalanced load. So we found then the extent of these deficiencies. And the way we do this is by evaluating this capacity-based design requirements as we've sort of illustrated this side. When we talk about these capacity-based design, we start not with what we designed the brace for, but we've selected a brace, and by selecting that brace, we have expected capacity and tension and compression, and we use that as a starting point for our, our, our design so that we have to check all of the members and the connections for that, that, uh, that capacity.
And we go through this, and we have, with when we deal with chevrons, we have this unbalanced load in the middle of the chevron beam where the braces intersect because the brace and tension, the tensile yield force, is a lot larger than the buckling force, and it's much, much larger than the buckling force after it's deteriorated through the cyclic loading. So we have to check that in our current design today. And we have methods by which we go through doing this, checking for the combined loading. So in doing this, we found that there are some very common deficiencies, and some of these deficiencies are very, very severe. And this table is tending to tabulate some of these deficiencies. One very common deficiency is brace slenderness. Almost invariably, the braces we saw and built, used in 1988 and earlier are much too slender to be used today. <clears throat> we see almost invariably that they were chevron brace frames used in 1988, and today we find that these chevron brace frames tip may only have one-fifth, one-sixth, even as one-eighth or one-tenth of what our current specifications say they require. <clears throat> we found that wells <clears throat> were, today we would require demand critical wells for these applications and we find that they, they were not used in any of these older brace frames. And when they were used, they were almost invariably sized for the design loads, meaning they're much too small for current applications. So there are many very, very severe deficiencies through this and, and we've taken and evaluated these deficiencies through an experimental program to evaluate which deficiencies seem to have be of really severe problems and which maybe are not so bad. And I think that's what we're going to see here today is that some of these deficiencies that we think are quite severe deficiencies aren't that big a problem, where others are extremely important. In doing this, we've tested a, a more than single, 60 single story, single bay brace frames. We've tested more than 10 multi story bay base frame, multi-story, single bay base brace frames, usually with composite slabs. And most of these tests were done in Taiwan, in, in Taipei, Professor Casey Tsai. And we've tested some other uh, <clears throat> Chevron brace frames. We've done hundreds, I would say actually thousands probably, of nonlinear analyses of these brace frames in support of this work. This sort of gives an illustration of the three different tests we have. On the left, you see the single bay geometry that we've tested in the University of Washington. In the middle, you see the geometry that we've used a great deal in, type, in the Encree Laboratory in Taipei, Taiwan. And on the right, you see this geometry that we've used for testing chevron brace frames in the University of Washington Laboratory. So we've tested these frames. Now when we do this, we're looking very much at how these structures will behave in that earthquake that will be occurring once every 500 years, and that earthquake that will occur 2,500 years, the really extreme, that's the ultimate we're designing for. And with this, we need to have yielding. And we use this chain analogy quite a bit recently. And the chain analogy, what we do with this chain analogy, we have that red link there. And that red link is a ductile link. And that link elongates. And when it elongates, the chain becomes longer. And that's more or less what we're trying to do with the structure. But eventually, the link breaks. <clears throat> Engineers cannot design anything that will not ever fail. This is a fiction that we've sort of convinced ourselves over the years. But so our concept is to focus on that link. But I think our focus is actually on more than that link. What we really would like to see is we would like to see multiple links yielding. So that maybe we get a chain that looks something like this. So that we have the red link that's going to actually be the controlling link and fracture. But we would like to have another link that helps with the inelastic deformation. And maybe even a third link that helps with the inelastic deformation. By doing this, it allows the structure to do a lot more with a lot less. It's going to allow the structure to get a lot bigger inelastic deformations and survive that really, really big earthquake without having quite so much strength and resistance. <clears throat> and to do this, we've uh, d done a wide range of experimental studies. Once again, this is the, the single diagonal test configuration that we've used with a lot of our testing at the University of Washington lab. And this is a photograph of this. Well, we've tested brace frames of this running from SCBFs to what we call NCBFs, which are the brace frames that are used 
prior to 1988, as well as, some, and we've developed some proposed methods for improving both modern design and construction, but also for retrofit of existing structures. Here you see the results, the inelastic result, test results of two brace frames. Now we test these things cyclically because an earthquake provides cyclic loading and the cyclic loading is going through inelastic deformation. If you see the frame on the left, the frame on the left was designed by the SCBF criteria by methods used in the SCBF criteria as of two 2005. It's pretty much identical to what was also in the 2010 SCBF design provisions. And you see, well, this system has some inelastic deformation capacity, but not that terribly much. It goes through an inelastic deformation of for about one one and a half one percent in one direction to a little bit more than one percent in the other direction. This is a, what we supposedly are designing for. This is what we thought was our ideal structure. But the fact of the matter is, it wasn't really delivering what we think it is. And the reason for this is, is because we were going through our design process and we found that maybe there are some ways of approving our existing design process. So on the right, you'll see another frame, which we tested a few months later, which has improvements made. This frame on the right had exactly the same brace, but it gets much, much more ductility and much more de de deformation capacity out of the system. And the reason for this is, is that system on the right was designed for cons the balanced design approach that we're talking about. The system on the right got yielding in multiple lengths before the first link failed. The system on the left had yielding in the first link and it failed in the first link. And so it we got more inelastic deformation from doing this because with our balanced design procedure, what we're doing is we're doing our capacity-based design and we're doing almost exactly the same thing that we did except for two or three things that make a difference. <clears throat> Welds joining the gusset plate to the beams and to the, the brace, to the columns, were designed in the original design by the uniform force method and the uniform force method based upon the expected capacity of the brace. And this we, is not the proper way to design a gusset plate if you want good and elastic behavior. You want to design the gusset plate to develop the welds of the gusset plate to design the expected capacity of the gusset plate because the gusset plate is going to go through rotation. And so it's the strength of the gusset plate that determines what the weld determines, not the strength of the brace. In the ori original design, we had a 2 T sub P clearance, linear clearance for the brace to buckle. This has been around for a number of years, but this is sometimes not the very good way to deal with it. And if you look at existing structures, you will never find a structure to provide satisfactory performance with this model. We instead used elliptical clearance model, a 6 T sub P clearance model with ellipt elliptical clearance. And this model allows a much more compact, thinner, smaller gusset plate, which actually improves the seismic performance quite a bit of the brace. <clears throat> and in addition, it, it, uh, it allows the, the brace end rotation to occur much more easily, and it represents the way you observe the behavior if you look at the experimental results of the test. <clears throat> For the gusset plate tension, in most design today, people use a 30-degree Whittemore, width, Whittemore angle. We're not, the Whittemore width is a very good way to design the gusset plate. But the 30-degree angle was developed by Whittemore about 70 years ago now, I believe. And it was on elastic gusset plates for bridges. So it was designed for elastic behavior, not for ultimate behavior that we're doing right now. So using this 30-degree angle becomes somewhat misleading. Today we're recommending a 345 triangle. This is a 37 degree angle. And we do this because it represents a better, more realistic representation of the elastic behavior. I should note that about 15 years ago there was a quite a considerable amount of research at the University of Alberta on gusset plate behavior and they actually recommended that you might be able to use a bigger angle. So this is this is really a fairly conservative choice that we're making right here, but it'll give you a better design for your gusset plate. Finally, we use a relaxed block shear criteria. This is not permissible yet in the uh, current 
AISC criteria, but I hope, I think, maybe it might be permissible in the next edition because there are provisions being considered that will make this happen. Well, if you do this, this balanced design procedure allows you to have a thinner, more compact gusset plate. It allows you to have actually a significantly improved brace frame behavior. And so everything we talk about from here on out will use this balanced design procedure because it enhances the, proven, the performance of the brace frame. This illustrates the difference between the elliptical clearance model and the two TCP clearance model. On the left you see the two TCP clearance model and you see that this really actually forces the brace out on the gusset plate. It means that the gusset plate is much longer, which means a compressive buckling typically controls the gusset plate. The elliptical clearance that we use right there on the right allows you to have a much more compact gusset plate. And since compressive buckling on seldom controls the gusset plate anymore, is typically controlled by tension. And we find that what we get is we get a much more compact, thinner gusset plate. And we feel that then that this, we design the welds for this thinner gusset plate. <clears throat> well, it turns out this, this, this makes a, a, fa a fairly uh, significant improvement in the performance of this thing. <clears throat> Another issue I guess we'd like, I'd like to make here today is engineers are conservative people. Now we all, I think we all, all pretty much agree with this. Most engineers have the idea, well, if, if, I, if, the, if big is good, maybe a little bigger is better. And I think I would really very much like to dissuade you from this idea in this seismic design. Particularly, I think you'll find that when you make something ultra-conservative, sometimes you're making it worse. You're going in the wrong direction. And this slide illustrates this. Here are two brace frames. These brace frames have exactly the same brace. The gusset plates and connections were designed by exactly the same rules. But the one on the left, we designed the gusset plate and the beam a little bit more conservatively. So it was a little bit bigger than it absolutely needed to be. The one on the right, had a gusset plate and a, and a beam, which were exactly what they needed to be. And I think you will find the one on the right has a significantly more inelastic deformation capacity. It will hold together through a much, much bigger and much more longer earthquake. So it's much better for us in the seismic design. And so this is one of the things that allows us to get good performance out of, a, out of brace frame systems. So uh, when you're designing by the balanced design procedure or any other design procedure, it's important that you give, design the connections and members for what they need to be. But it's not a good idea to be ultra conservative because doing, going more may in fact take you in the wrong direction. It may in fact result in inferior performance. <clears throat> I'd like to further emphasize the benefits of distributed yielding. This is a connection we tested. Now, the, the, this connection is simulating an older brace frame, and it has many, many deficiencies. There are at least four or five major deficiencies in the design of this connection. Yet, if you look at the performance on the right, it's pretty good. It's, the performance is probably just about what we would expect with an SCBF. So if we have all of these rules, we're SCBFs, and this fails all of these rules, how are we getting this kind of good behavior? And the point we'd like to make is that some of the ways, some of the rules that we're designing for in our connections are much more critical than others. This frame got very good inelastic behavior. We had understrength bolts. The bolts were not as strong as they needed to be. The welds were under strength. They were not what they needed to be. It didn't have adequate end ro rotation clearance, and it didn't have the net section requirement that re reinforcement that it need. Yet it got very, very good inelastic behavior. Why did it do this? Well, one reason is because the bolts were under strength, but they were under strength in bearing, which is if you're going to have your bolts under strength, that's probably the best way to have it because by, by having the bolts under strength and bear bearing, you're going to typically get some uh, bolt hole elongation. And that bolt hole elongation is going to add and improve, improve your inelastic performance. It's going to increase your inelastic deformation. So this particular system, by accident, had two or three secondary chains of yielding 
that benefited so that before we got that really ultimate brace factor, which should have occurred fairly early, it uh, actually got quite large deformation capacity, even though it had a number of de deficiencies by current standards. Local slenderness, on the other hand, is kind of deadly. If a brace is, does not meet the local, local, sl 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 local slenderness limit, you may find that the brace will fracture at very, very small deformations. It may have fractured almost elastically. And that's what we see happening in this particular test right here. So you have to say, I would have to say that local slenderness, failing the local slenderness limit, is a, probably a very, very serious deficiency. But maybe it's not such an end, end problem because this test had the same brace with the same local slenderness, but we filled it with concrete. We, this was a hollow tube. We filled the hollow tube with concrete. The concrete must not engage the gusset plate connection. The, with these concrete-filled tubes, several people have tested them with the concrete engaging the connection, and this may not work well because if the concrete engages the, con the end connection, it makes the brace stronger, and that's not what you want. You don't want to make the brace stronger. You want to make it more ductile. And so the concrete stops short of the connection, as you'll see from the, the, that shaded area on the figure. And by doing this, the brace fr fracture was delayed considerably. Now, there were multiple deficiencies with this, and just fixing the brace fracture didn't solve many of the other problems. We did have a gusset plate weld fracture that caused a loss of strength earlier, but the brace itself held up through fairly, very large deformations before it failed. <clears throat> so we have some issues about uh, the weld also, I might add. <clears throat> So we said the welds are often sized and typically not demand critical in these older structures. And so we've used uh, very successfully weld overlays. Now AISC does not like weld overlays very much and they're, not, they're certainly discouraged if not pro prohibited in the current specifications. They were tried in the Sac Steel project for moment frames and did not provide much benefit. But for these brace frame gusset plate connections, they've worked very, very well. We've used weld overlays of demand critical welds to make the welds the sizes that we need, needed to be. And we found that in general, they behave very, very well. They got good elastic performance and they developed the capacity of the brace, which is what they needed to do. <clears throat> we do find that there is one kind of uh, uh, to weld that we, uh, we, 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 we were most concerned about. A lot of those older connections had shear plates connecting the uh, gusset plate and the beam to the column. And we found that if that shear plate were to fail, that represents a very severe problem because both the beam and the column separate. But we found that these weld overlays seem to work very, very well. We think that you get work, get a lot better performance with shear plates if they are a single shear plate joining the weld and the beam, the, joining the gusset plate and the beam weld. If you have double shear plates, one for the web, one for the gusset plate, they sometimes work against each other and don't work as well. But we've had pretty good success with that particular type of uh, uh, retrofit. So we find that these weld overlays have been pretty effective and we've had pretty good success with them. I've talked about the weak chevron beams. We said that mostly chevron beams of older structures don't have anywhere near what we currently have to require. So we tested up one of these weak chevron frames in uh, the Inquiry Laboratory in Taiwan several years ago and we actually got pretty good performance with it. Hopefully this is going to work. Uh, no, it's not. You can, it's a little animation of showing time-lapse uh, figures of uh, the deformation of this. So you can see there's quite a lot of deformation happening within. There, the beam is deforming a great deal. Now this frame had multiple deficiencies, but it performed reasonably well. And we said, well, there were the beam deflection. There were beam deflections in it, and the beam deflections were not insignificant, but they were not extremely large either. And so we felt that maybe there is something here to be learned about new construction because this was deficient by current standards by a great deal. 
So as a consequence, we have, and this is the hysteretic behavior, you will see that the inelastic deformation is actually pretty good. This led us to some thinking about, well, maybe we should be using this sequence of yielding concepts on the chevron beams. Here, what we were having, with that, that test that you saw right there, we had brace fracture, we had a, in some of the braces, we had connection fracture. If we solve the brace fracture and the connection fracture, which we might so solve by filling the brace with concrete and by using weld overlays to solve the weld problems, then what we can, we're gonna be controlled by is yielding of the beam. And the concern about this is that, can we live with yielding of the beam only? And we felt that, that there was some long-term promise of that particular concept. So I'd like to just briefly summarize here. With these older tests, what we're finding is that large local slenderness deficiencies, B over T ratios, that's a serious problem. Undersized wells that are not tough are not serious problems. Uh, the shear plates are an issue, particularly the double shear plates, we find that they don't work together very well. It's much better with having a single continuous shear plate on the web and the, the gusset plate. Some other problems don't seem to be that big of an issue. We find that concrete fill is a fairly good way of uh, fixing uh, the beams, and we find that weld overlays are a good way of uh, repairing weld issues, and we find that actually that the beam yielding concern doesn't seem to be that great of a concern. So we started another program, which was funded entirely by AISC, which was saying, well, maybe we can use yielding beams as a benefit to new construction. And we tested six single-story, single-bay frames, as shown on the left here, and we tested a three-story, single-bay brace frame, Chevron with yielding beams, at the Encree Lab in, ta in Taiwan a little over a year ago. The behavior that we got was very, very good. The behavior that you see right here, if you, you have to actually look at the numbers, but actually these yielding beams, this figure on the right is a single story chevron with a yielding beam that has about one third of what we today would say is required. And you can see that this frame developed its full required strength and it maintained this strength through a much larger deformations than a brace that we designed with a strong beam. Why does this happen? Because with a, str with a strong beam, the beam does not deflect very much, and so the brace is subject to large tensile loads. Tension is what fractures the brace, not compression. Here we have a beam that's yielding, the beam deflects a little bit. And the deflection of the beam means that the brace does not have such large tensile strains. It has larger compressive strains. And it goes through those deformations, it holds its resistance quite well, and it provides the inelastic deformation capacity of the brace frame that's significantly larger. So the second question would be, why shouldn't we be doing this in a new construction? And this is something I think you will see us talking about here. I have a little animation here again, if I get it done right. Oh, and that's not the right way. Why am I not getting this? Try this. This is a, an animation of that test that we showed a few minutes ago that was had one third of the strength. You notice how quickly people move in our lab. Even old guys like me move pretty fast in there. But anyway, this is a test you can see going through this behavior. And, and watch the brace. You see the braces are going through fairly significant deformation. The frame is going through fairly large inelastic deformations. And it's going, and the beam is deflecting. But the deflections are not as horrendous as many people might suspect. Keep going through larger and larger deformations. Eventually the braces fracture. 
So we find that actually having a yielding Chevron beam seems like it gives you actually probably better performance than we are expecting from uh, other race frames. We tested a three-story frame in Taiwan at uh, KC Tsai's laboratory. And uh, this is a little animation of that, if I may, it works. You can see the braces buckling. The, the, the beam is deflecting a bit. It has a, con has a composite slab on this particular frame. Brace is going through a lot of inelastic deformation. This is what we expect a brace frame to do during an earthquake. And the thing you'll note is, is that the brace is actually going through larger deformations and the frame is going through larger deformations because of the yielding of the beam. This frame went to a story drift of nearly 6% in the bottom story that you're looking at here and the braces didn't fracture. And we found that, we found, so we find this concept to be a very promising concept for a, a new construction. Anyway, uh, I'm going to leave it to my more attractive con colleague to finish up here. And uh, Thanks, Charles. Okay, so uh, obviously we've done quite a bit of testing and what I would like to do now is do three things with these tests. So the first thing that I'd like to do is go through and talk a little bit about the retrofit strategies that we used on this, the N non-ductile, we call it, uh, CBF systems. And then I'd like to talk a little bit about the new uh, provisions that are being proposed by AISC to essentially replace the steel chapter that's currently in ASCE 41 and then talk a little bit about the system um, performance with d some dynamic analyses that we've done. So like Charles said, we have found three categories of deficiencies. So the most severe category of deficiency is that the brace is usually cross-sectionally slender. We found in our infrastructure review that cross-sectionally slender braces were more common than um, geometrically slender braces in terms of their overall length. And so there are two options. I think until now my discussions with engineers, they typically will replace the brace. But as we've shown in the testing, um, you can actually just fill the tube with concrete, which is a very economical uh, solution. The second deficiency that is quite severe is having a short weld connecting the brace to the gusset plate. So if you were to fill the brace with concrete, you would probably need to use a weld overlay. As we've said, that, that has been quite effective. Um, and then the interface welds, we usually term them, those are the welds between the framing elements, the beam and the column, and the gusset plate are um, typically weak. They are undersized and they are not uh, usually d demand critical weld materials. So there are a couple of different options um, there. Uh, usually we've looked at weld overlays, but we did also look at one um, connection that we reinforced. So the, one of the things that we did um, was try to actually quantify when these retrofit priorities need to be used. So one, my feeling with ASC 41 is it doesn't really give you a good way of addressing retrofit. And in this program, we really tried to give you quantitative ways of saying, do I need to retrofit these particular components of the system? The other thing is if you go back to the chain that Charles was discussing, where you have the chain that, the piece of the chain that ends up fracturing that's red, which is almost always going to be the brace, we know if we can even get a balanced design retrofit approach and we can allow some gusset plate yielding as well as some beam yielding, we can get a lot more deformation capacity out of the system. And I will show you actually that we can get the same collapse um, probability with an SCBF and a retrofitted NCBF. So I'm not going to go through the numbers in detail. They have actually, this is, um, will lead into what we're proposing for 342. But you can see that we have um, B over T limits for the brace. And when it's a low, moderate, or high priority for retrofit, we have um, DCRs that Charles um, t discussed for the weld, that is what's the strength of the gus brace to gusset weld relative to the strength of the brace, and the same thing, what's the strength of the gusset to um, the, the interface weld strength. Um, and then 
Also, chevron beam yielding, which we've shown through the experiments, is not as detrimental as one might think. So just to highlight these in terms of the retrofit priorities, this is a repeat of what Charles showed. But the system on the left shows what happens if you have a very high B over T brace. And the system on the right has the exact same brace that's been filled with concrete, where the concrete does not engage the gusset plate. This is the, a comparison of a system where the gusset plate weld fractured, so that's what the first arrow is indicating. You see that there is some residual capacity, but in the second case where we had a nominally identical specimen and we reinforced the, um, the weld, we didn't have any fracture and we got essentially the same performance. Now I will say this is a system that did not have a very slender brace. This is a system that had a brace that was compliant with the current AISC seismic provisions. And then the last one that I'll highlight is um, one of the um, systems that Charles showed where we had a vertical shear plate that connected the gusset and the beam to the column with an inadequate weld and we both filled the brace, which is what that shaded um, section indicates, but we also bolted the um, connection plate. So this is another option and uh, w bolt hull elongation as Charles showed in one of his um, first slides looking at the NCBF systems can be quite beneficial. And so you can see we got better behavior here. The other thing to realize um, with a retrofitted system or actually with any system is, especially if you're worried about collapse, the post peak capacity really comes into preventing collapse of the system. So in this case, although um, we didn't increase the strength and we did increase the deformation capacity a little bit, having that residual capacity gives us much better performance. So one of the things that we've also done, and I'll bring this up again when I talk about the dynamic analyses that we've conducted, is we've tried to characterize the hysteretic behavior of the system. So I'm going to use these figures uh, when I talk about what we have done in the analyses that we've performed. So you can see the figure on the top left, which is figure A. So this kind of, look, for those of you who are familiar with ASC 41, looks a little bit like an ASC 41 backbone type curve. So A obviously is a pretty non-ductal system with no residual capacity. Uh, type B is, has the same strength has the same drift capacity before it started to lose lateral strength, but actually does have some residual capacity, and I, as I said, that really can make a difference in terms of collapse prevention. Uh, type C sort of has more than one failure mode, and so you get these two steps in the reduction of the capacity, and type D is more of what you would expect from an SCBF. And the same thing is true, we can characterize the connections that way as well. So uh, the next thing I want to talk about is what we're proposing for uh, the new AISC 342 standard. So I'm going to present this in um, terms of chapters, but which may not mean that much to you um, because probably very few of you have actually seen this. Uh, but the, but chapter C is really looking at evaluating. A component. So we're specifically looking at two types of components. We're looking at braces, and those braces fall under members that are subjected to axial or combined loading. And then we have a whole new section on brace frame connections. So those of you who are familiar with ASC 41, we have had that for moment frames. Now we're introducing rotation limits um, for brace frame connections so that you can assess the performance of not just the, the brace, but the connection as well. Because if there's one thing to get out of our talks usually is that the brace alone is not a brace frame. You need to consider the connection and the beams and columns. And then in chapter E, we have um, modeling uh, recommendations for these systems. So this is one of a number of different envelopes that are available um, in the 342 specification. So here we're looking at a force, either deformation, axial deformation, or um, rotation response. So it'll be axial deformation for the brace. It'll be um, rotation for the connection. And you can see that we hit, reach a certain amount of strength, which is you know determined um, using standard procedures, and there's a residual capacity which is uh, termed F there. 
So that's a little f on the right hand side of the, that. So um, with the brace modeling, one of the biggest changes that we're making is that the brace response really needs to not just depend on the global slenderness but the local slenderness as well as you've seen with the test that is really one of the most important um, things and so we have a way of calculating D, so D is the plastic deformation capacity of the brace which is a function of the local slenderness, it's a function of the um, global slenderness as well as the material properties of the brace. So this is how you would calculate the envelope for a brace. It comes from a large number of tests so you can see that these plots are basically showing that we have trends with all three of these characteristics, uh, cross-sectional slenderness, global slenderness as well as the properties of the brace and so that's why the expression has been um, used that way. And the other thing I want to say just in general uh, with a movement in seismic evaluation is to go away from tabulated values where you have to interpolate between all of those rows which I don't know exactly how you do because every time I try to use it seems quite cumbersome and so we've gone here as you can see to a single expression that you can use which should make things um, easier. This is a comparison of a number of different tests that we've done as well as has been tested elsewhere. The dashed line is what's currently in ASCE 41. The solid line, the solid envelope that's black shows what we're proposing for the new AISC 342 specification and what you can see is that in many cases the current ASCE 41 is really overestimating the capacity of the brace especially if you have a very high B over T ratio because the, the, that particular provision does not account for the impact of the B over T ratio on the plastic deformation capacity of the brace. So the next thing that we um, looked at which is really a new addition to this provision is the type of connection. So you can have two types of connections. One would be a rotationally restrained connection that is that the connection is not going to allow out of plane movement of the brace so it's, it's not going to accommodate the deformation demand that's coming or the rotation demand that's coming from the brace on the connection and then the second would be a rotation accommodating connection. So this is obviously what is currently in the seismic specification. Uh, we've added this as well to um, to this specification. This is just a very um, high level figure on what we're proposing in terms of modeling. So I do know talking to some practicing engineers that they aren't really modeling the connections. We feel it's very important to model the gusset plate connection. So we're proposing, which I'll talk about in a, in a minute, um, a, just a pretty simple rotational spring for the gusset plate that depends on the properties of the gusset plate and then because the gusset plate is connected to the beams and the columns, it's providing um, additional stiffness to a portion of the beam and a portion of the column as you can see here. So you can see that you would want to use a rigid end zone or a stiffened element along the full length of the gusset plate that is connected to the column and along about three quarters of the length of the gusset plate that is connected to the beam. And then we're using um, the same type of envelope that we are using for the brace and uh, in this case we don't, we're not, we don't really get um, deterioration. What we really are looking at is what is the plastic rotation deformation which is term D in this case using the, um, the terminology that's in uh, 342 and you can see that that um, deformation capacity depends on the geometry of the brace so that's on the figure on the right is looking at what the effective length of the braces in um, compression as well as the thickness of the plate and uh, the ratio of the weld capacity to the plate capacity which goes back to what Charles discussed with our SCBF design. And then if you aren't rotation cut accommodating or even if you are, you st it's still treated as 
a force controlled element for some of the actions, so for non-ductile actions, so you need to do, you need to check net section fracture, block shear fracture, um, gross uh, flexural buckling, and bolted connection limit states, and this is all um, in the ballot that we've put together for the change in the provision. So section E of the provision uh, is addressing modeling provisions, and so we have three different modeling approaches for brace frames. The first one is just a generalized force deformation relation that's sort of in line of what um, has been in ASC 41 since its inception. The second is using fiber-based line elements. Uh, that is typically what we've done, and with the, with the dynamic analyses I'll show you, that's um, what we've used. Um, the third would be to have some sort of lumped plasticity or concentrated spring element. So that is a pretty short summary of what we have proposed for 342. If you're interested in learning more about it, please ask one of us. We'd be happy to share uh, more information. So uh, the next thing and the last thing that I will talk about is really looking at the system response. So uh, we have done a lot of simulation. As Charles said, we've done thousands of simulations. And when I say we, I don't mean Charles or me. <laughs> I mean the brilliant students that we have had working with us, especially I want to acknowledge Andy Sen, who is a postdoc with us right now and has done most of the analyses that I'm going to show you. And so we looked at three different systems in this case. We looked at an NCBF, and I'm going to show that as a, a square that's thin, so it indicates a high B over T ratio, a retrofitted and CBF, in this case, we're going to fill the brace with concrete. You could replace the brace with a low B over T brace that's um, compliant with the code, or in some cases, people use buckling restraint braces. We've done both of those things, and um, a current SCBF that meets the balanced design procedure. We looked at um, different building heights, three stories and nine stories. Uh, because of time, I'm not going to present all of those results. You'd never get out of here. Uh, we've looked at different um, brace frame configurations, and then we looked at these three different categories of deficiencies, like I discussed um, in that table initially. So the first is the brace deficiency, second are connection deficiencies, and then the third are weak um, columns and beams. This is an overview of the buildings. Like I said, we looked at three-story and nine-story buildings with um, different configurations. I'm pretty much going to focus on the three-story buildings. We, uh, for these buildings, I don't know, maybe we're Seattle-centric, but we located the buildings in Seattle, so that's the seismicity that we're using. The, uh, spectra, the response spectra that are shown on the bottom right are for what would be using the you know, current ASCE 7-16. Um, and then the dashed line, which is maybe a little bit harder to see, is what would you would get if you used, um, I think it's the 79 UBC. So one of the things I want you to take from that is for these three-story buildings, they are going to be a lot weaker, about have about half the strength of a modern three-story SCBF. And that will come into a little bit when we start looking at performance. Uh, this goes back to what Charles showed, and I'm not going to get into the aspects of the modeling because that could be an hour presentation on its own. Um, but we, we made sure that we were modeling both inelastic action, so we made sure that we were getting yielding, not just the primary yield mechanisms, but the secondary yield mechanisms, and that we were also able to model fracture of the gusset plate connection um, welds, typically, as well as the brace. So all of that is embedded in the results that I'm going to show you. This shows um, a nine-story building model, um, and it just gives an indication of what we're modeling. So we've got uh, nonlinear beam column elements for the braces, the beams, and the columns. We have a fracture model for the brace. We have a gusset plate um, rotation uh, spring that is just simulating the overall gusset plate response. Uh, we've assumed 
our rigid diaphragm. Uh, we have different models, which I'll talk to you a little bit about for modeling fracture of the gusset plate, depending on what the DCR is. And then we have a P delta column, which is essentially representing the gravity frame in these systems. So I am not a seismologist, and I'm not going to pretend to be one, but there are a lot of different ways to look at seismic performance. We are using what people are now terming a multi-stripe analysis. All that really means is that we're looking at a number of different return periods. So Charles mentioned two return periods, which would be the 475-year event and the 2475-year event. Those are the most uh, common events that, that we talk about. But we also looked at additional 5,000-year uh, uh, five, uh, return period um, as well as about a 1,000-year return period. For each one of these return periods, we had 30 ground motions and um, we scaled them between about half of the fundamental period of the elastic structure to five times the fundamental period because, of course, when you start getting inelastic action and fracture, the period of the building elongates. So just focusing on the, um, matching the fundamental period uh, doesn't work. And, uh, and so obviously we've run a lot of analyses. This is a little bit more um, refined than 342, but is um, similar to what we're proposing for, uh, for AISC 342, where we have been looking at three different um, performance states. So one of the things is even though a lot of times when people talk about performance, they look at collapse, um, the truth is a lot of times after an earthquake, we really do care about repair and replacement. So we really do care about component damage. So we've tried to look at both do we need to go in and repair something? And, and then what's the probability of collapse? And, and these are the expressions that we're using. Like I said, um, we're looking at the brace. We're looking at the brace to gusset weld. We're looking at uh, the gusset to beam weld. Uh, we have the beam, obviously, uh, and then column buckling. And then this is just uh, to remind you of what I mean when I show A, B, C, and D in terms of the deformation uh, capacity. So just as the letter goes up, the ductility goes up. So this is a system with a brace deficiency, which obviously I think by now you probably know is the most um, severe deficiency. So like I said, there are 30 ground motions, and I'm going to show you the results, but I think it is instructive just to look at what happens if I have an NCBF, a retrofitted NCBF, and an SCBF just for one ground motion. So this is for, this is a single ground motion um, that is essentially representing the 2475 hazard level. So you can see that B, that would be the NCBF, and D, that would be the SCBF. So in the gray, you can see what's happening with the story drift with the NCBF. Once the brace fractures, we're getting a lot of uh, story drift demand up to 8%. I'm not sure that's actually realistic, but that's what the analyses tell us. So if we take that same system and we fill the brace with concrete, you can see what happens. We get a significant reduction in the deformation demand. If I compare that with an SCBF, we get a, about the same deformation demand. Obviously, the SCBF is stronger because it was designed for a higher equivalent lateral force uh, demand. Then we can run all of the 30 pairs of ground motions for the 2475 hazard level, and you can see the difference in what we're getting for the median uh, drift. So that's the median is shown with the dark black line. Every gray line indicates a single ground motion, and you can see that. Um, and then the dash line is the 84th percentile. So in some cases with the NCVF, we're calculating from the analyses drift demands that exceed uh, 8%. I, I'm not claiming that our analyses are accurate enough to go to that large drift demands, but that is what we're getting out of the analyses. Most likely the system would have collapsed already. Uh, and then with the retrofitted NCBF and the SCBF, we're getting about the same um, median drift demands. We can look at this in a different way where we look at what's the probability of exceeding a certain damage state, which is usually 
um, quantified as I've shown you with an engineering parameter, so either with a deformation demand, um, some kind of fracture model that we have, which is either based, for the brace we base it on strain, for the gusset, um, for the, the connection failures we usually base it on rotation. So again, the, the very left column is the NCBF, the middle is the retrofitted NCBF, the right is the SCBF. And on the x-axis is the return period of the earthquake. So one of the things you can see is that we're getting a pretty high probability of having significant number of these NCVFs collapse in the 2475 event. Whereas if we just take those systems and uh, fill the brace with concrete, we actually reduce the collapse probability quite a bit and in fact in this direction where we have three bra base braids, the retrofitted system and the SCBF system look very similar. The next uh, deficiency that we looked at was the brace to gusset weld deficiency. So here with the retrofitted system, we're assuming that the brace has been taken care of either by filling it with concrete or replacing it. So what happens is that um, this is just repair. This, the question is, do I need to go in and do something to the system after the earthquake? And you can see that um, here with the NCBF where we have high um, DCRs greater than one, that for even for the 500 year return period, you're going to have to go in and repair these systems. So obviously with uh, the 2475 event, every single weld is, is predicted to be damaged. Here, if we both use a concrete filled brace and a weld overlay, we've significantly reduced the need to repair the system, not just in the 500 year event, but also um, in the uh, 2475 um, return period event. Then we can do the same thing and look at, at collapse. Again, you can see that the collapse potential in the 2475 event is very, very high, but if we retrofit both the brace and the weld, we, which are, is indicated with these two blue lines, um, that we get, this, we get a very low collapse probability, even in the 2475 event. So another um, deficiency that is um, obviously important is the gusset interface weld. And so in this case, I'm going to do the same thing I did with the brace where you can see here I'm showing for the same earthquake what happens if I only have a gusset interface weld deficiency. I'm assuming that the brace is um, compliant in one way or another. So you can see that um, if I don't retrofit that, again, I'm getting really large drift demands, um, over 8% in the 2475 hazard level. If we use the weld overlay, we significantly reduce that um, demand. And if we compare that with an SCBF, we're getting a pretty similar response. So we can, again, look at these two different um, uh, performance states, so one would be do I need to do something to repair or replace uh, the, the weld? And obviously as the rotation capacity of the weld increases, which is essentially what we're showing as these colors get darker, the probability of needing to do any repairs, especially in the 500 year event, goes almost down to zero. How do you make sure that you have more rotation capacity? You use a weld overlay or you could, I guess, grind out the, the existing weld and then um, re-weld it. But like Charles said, we've had a lot of luck using these weld overlays. And the same thing is true with collapse. You can reduce the collapse potential by using um, a weld overlay. So the last efficiency I want to talk about is a beam deficiency. So this goes back to some of the work that we have been doing recently. Now, there are some NCBFs out there that have very, very, very weak beams relative to the strength of the braces, you know. So this is not true for every, um, for every beam. But in this case, we looked at beams that had a strength that was um, uh, anywhere from, uh, 
0.6, so a DCR of 0.6, less than one, so stronger than that is required by the current seismic provisions up to three, so three times essentially weaker than is um, required by the provisions. And so you can see that even with a weak beam, um, this is a retrofitted NCBF that is the, that the brace is um, not uh, fracture critical. You can see that um, with the, as the DCRs increase, we get um, really pretty similar response. So again, these systems are weaker than an SCBF, so we don't see the same thing we're seeing with the SCBF system where we're getting an improvement in response, but when we look at the column and beam deficiencies in terms of collapse, which is essentially what we're showing here, so this is the DCR of the column. If the DCR is above one, the column is weaker than required by current code. This is the DCR of the beam. If the DCR is above one, it's weaker than required by current code. And what the fact that it's all shaded the same color says that, the, that having a weaker beam does not increase the collapse resistance of the NCBF. So it, this can obviously be a huge uh, money savi savings when you go in and look at these systems and retrofit them because obviously going in and having to replace all the beams in the building is uh, quite costly. So uh, I think we've um, fed you quite a lot of materials. Uh, and so I, just to bring it back, I'd like to make a couple of conclusions. The first is that there are really these three categories of deficiencies. So one is a cross-sectionally slender brace. The second is welds that have DCRs that are greater than one. That is, they are not um, capacity designed for either the brace or the gusset plate, depending on, on which weld. And uh, this idea that, the, that you would need and would like to have secondary yield mechanisms, so that's not just true in a modern system, but also in a retrofitted system. So uh, we have been using this balanced design methodology and kind of using it towards coming up with a retrofit methodology. So the first thing that you would do is look at the brace. We know that the brace is going to fracture and that in the end is the desired fracture mechanism, but we don't want to have a premature fracture. So we need to go in and make sure that the brace meets the geometric um, limits. So either you would have a concrete filled brace or you would replace the brace. We'd like to have secondary yield mechanisms. Typically in our tests, we found three secondary yield mechanisms. Gusset plate yielding, which goes to the balanced design procedure that we're using for SCBFs now, bolt hole elongation, and beam yielding. Uh, and so this sort of results in that type C behavior where you may get some reduction in strength, but you get a lot of this sort of secondary strength, which gives you a lot of collapse um, resistance. We looked at um, these beams, as I showed you just recently, uh, one of the last slides, uh, we looked at beams with DCRs of uh, up to about two and a half. There was absolutely no change in um, the collapse probability. But the welds that are there, because of the weld materials and their size, they really need to be, um, they, they need to be retrofitted, and, and we are recommending a weld overlay. If you properly retrofit an NCBF, you can get the same collapse probability um, that you have with an SCBF. And in general, with our analyses, we're seeing a class probability in the 2475 event between uh, 5 and 20%. So the future work that we're doing is looking, as I, as I had mentioned, uh, balancing this through this should, that should be AISC, not ASCE. So uh, balancing the change from going from ASC 41 to the AISC 342. We've already submitted that ballot. We have not really looked at different loadings. So there is some concern in Seattle with basin type loadings, uh, subduction zone loadings with long duration motions. Um, we have developed um, some improved models uh, for secondary yield mechanisms that we are, are we, that we've started to implement in there. There are some other uh, deficiencies with NCBFs that we have not uh, looked at such as locally slender um, beams and columns. A lot of times the vertical, uh, the lateral load resisting system is not continuous vertically, which is obviously an issue, um, as well as column splices. 
So I think Charles and I would both really like to thank our sponsors. Um, we are in debt to Tom. He's been a great partner with this, as has AISC. As Charles mentioned, we had three um, uh, projects funded by the National Science Foundation. We're very in debt to Professor Casey Sai, who um, has been a great collaborator with us for well over a decade, and um, we are have been very happy to work with him uh, and his students. So am I supposed to do the assessment question first, Tom, or, am I, or are they allowed to ask questions themselves? Um, pardon me? They can ask questions. Okay, and then, and then I'm supposed to test them? Pardon? I have these assessment questions that I've been told I was supposed to oh, give you're them. Ask the now. Oh, I'm going to ask the assessment question now, I've been told. Okay. So the worst time to teach is right after lunch. And from what I can tell, this presentation is right after lunch. But maybe you are paying attention. So the first question is. Um, what is likely to be the more economical option to retrofit a brace frame that has, a, has an HSS 8 by 8 by 3 8 inch brace and it meets all the other SCBF requirements? Yes, somebody learned something. Yes, fill it with concrete. Do you engage the gusset plate? No. no. That was my bonus. I know that I didn't have that on there, but um, how about if I have a, a NCBF that meets all the SCBF requirements, but the beam is only half, only has half the strength required by the current seismic provisions? What should I do? Nothing. Nothing. Very good. Excellent. So they pass. They pass. That means that they get. Did you, do you have candy to throw at them or anything, or no? No candy? All right. No espressos to go around after lunch? Okay. Um, anyway, I, I would really like to thank you um, for coming and listening to us talk about this. This has been a really fantastic project. We would be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Yes? A great presentation. Thank you. Uh, my question is, And the stiffness characteristics associated with those flanges, and then also the the webs, and how stiff those are, and how that would affect the rest of the plate out of plane bending. So our, those are probably not tightening back sections at, at that point. Right. So you, you, in a retrofit, yeah. you may not have very much stiffness there. So. Right. Uh, no, that's a good point, uh, and that is something we haven't looked at. We have on another project, actually it was to do with BRBs, we've used cover plates on the web if the web is really thin. I will say if you have a chevron um, beam, you've you do have a large axial load going through there, so you need to be cognizant of that. Uh, I, sometimes it's a little counterintuitive, but sometimes you actually might need to think about replacing the brace with something that's weaker and bracing more bays, which is probably not the answer the contractor wants. Um, but that, that sometimes what's really limiting you is um, not so much the brace, but could be the beam and the column. So. But, but you're, you're counting on post-yield behavior that's fairly predictable with springs in series, right? It's all about the post-yield slope. So I think those, those framing elements probably are pretty important. Yes. The next question is uh, composite. I don't, I, do you have something you want to add to that, Charles? Well, well, we, we, we certainly subscribe to the concept that the framing element should be designed for the capacity of the brace. So we, we don't want those members to be too weak. And I, I think that in general, my, it's we, My uh, question is not one of strength, it's one of stiffness, where the, that you should get you show out of plane bending in the gusset plane. And that bending will be affected I, by I think, I think it's, a, it's a compact member. I don't think we have to. And if, if the beam column connection is, is adequate. Now, we've tested some where we've had a gusset plane where the beam column connection was 
with only a web connection. And that, now, something like that is it's a very flexible connection and it does cause problems, as you suggest. But when you have a welded flange, we've had things that worked out very well. Yeah, we haven't looked at the, the, the uh, those those um, components that don't meet. We do. We do. We, we did that. That that is not something that we have studied, and it really can't be studied with the open seas analyses that we were doing. We'd really have to go. We've done. I didn't show them, but we've done analyses in um, Abacus, and so you'd really need to use a program like Abacus to try to start looking at that. We, we, I think. I think we have a limit. Recommendation we made that we like to see the web of the beam and the yeah. is at 80%. 75%, yeah. Yeah. That's from another project that we we did, but that is what we recommend is that, you know, if you have a really thin web that you need, that web needs to have 80% of the thickness uh, or 75, I think it actually might be 75% of the thickness of the, um, the gusset plate. Uh, do you really want to go into this? We, this is a we can talk about. later. Yeah. I'm sorry about this. Yeah. But we use P695, P but if you'll forgive myself, my, my French, P695 is a little bit of a BS. It really, is, it really is. We actually prefer a much better approach for doing this. We haven't talked about it very much today. But what we tend to do is we try to get a suite of earthquake acceleration records that represent a hazard and try to see what percentage of our structures behave to a certain level of performance. Some of the things I've seen with B695, I don't think are very credible. I think today we're deluding ourselves you, it's, in the, what it's telling us. Yeah, it's just, you can't just take a ground motion and scale it up. And then, and so we have tried, we are, we've used this multi-stripe analysis approach, which has um, been proposed by Jack Baker, where we select ground motions that are representative of that return period earthquake. You can't just take a 500-year event and scale it up and now all of a sudden say it's a 2,500-year event. And so, um, yeah, I, I, I agree with Charles. I, I, I don't. I don't think that that method is giving us um, reliable answers, and so that's. And but the suite of ground motions for that methodology are set, so you are really constrained. So that's why we've gone to this multi-stripe approach. We, we have formed those analyses, however. Yeah, we have done them. We can give you a paper if you want. Yeah. Yeah, we, you, we put a hole in it, and I think we used pea gravel, didn't we, Char She's asking how we filled the brace with concrete. It was already assembled in our lab. It was in the lab. We, we, we just stuffed something in to keep it from contacting the uh, connection. And we, and we used stiff foam. Pea gravel, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You, Right, so you need to have, you, you need to put something at the bottom of the brace that's essentially acting as a form so that you have that space between the, the um, end of the gusset and the edge of the concrete. And then we had a hole at the other end of the brace and filled it up. You, but you probably want to use a pea gravel mix so that your rock isn't too large. The second question that I had. Yep. In terms of the strength? In terms of the, the thickness? Yeah. yeah, we are using the same criteria that we're using for the balance design procedure where if you are designing the brace to gusset weld, then you design it for the tensile capacity of the brace. If you're designing a gusset to beam or gusset to column weld, then you design it for the capacity of the gusset plate. Let's say I had a 516 Yep. 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 You still get to use the existing weld. Yeah. I, I still get to use the existing weld. 
Yeah. And we have, I should have, I, one of us should have probably mentioned, we have papers that we've written on all of this. If you're interested, we can send them to you. But did you say that AIC wasn't, didn't approve the reinforcing wealth yet? No, we said, well, AIC has not approved the block shear provisions. Okay. I was just curious, historically, how we, how you feel like we got here. The change from 88 to these rules that maybe weren't the best guidance in terms of the Chevron beam, the 2T yielding, that was very deliberately changed, and it seems like now we're going to I, I'm probably old enough that I can just about tell you why. Okay, in about 1983, there was a brace frame tested in Japan as part of the U.S.-Japan program. And this brace frame in Japan did not behave particularly well, and it had Chevron brace. It had a number of design flaws. We would say that you let design flaws with it. And the, the consequence of that, that is the motivation that started a lot of the brace frame changes in the United States. But the Northridge earthquake also did a lot of this because the Northridge earthquake occurred in 1994 and everybody thought that you make it out of steel, you no matter what you do, as long as it's steel, it's going to be okay. And you know, I think it quite, that earthquake quite clearly proved that you had to do a little bit more than just make it out of steel. And so these are the things that I think motivated the process to going towards the rules that we use today. But some of the rules were just seated in the past rules. Somebody said, I think you've got to do something. And uh, sometimes I think they did the right thing. Sometimes maybe it wasn't so good. So one thing I'll tell you, uh, this is not the subject of this particular talk, but the, well, just with the 2T linear offset, um, those tests were done and they were on tapered plates. If you taper the plate, um, you essentially convert almost to the elliptical clearance. But the problem is when you apply the 2T linear offset to a rectangular plate, you know, engineers were showing us when they were getting huge plates. And um, so I think one, of the thing that ha one thing that happened is that, that, you know, that we weren't really considering that in design. And so then when we were looking at the yield patterns and some of the other tests, we were you know, noticing this, it had this elliptical um, yield pattern. And that's sort of when we started realizing that not only did we want to improve the performance, but we also wanted to improve the constructability of the system. So I don't, I mean, it's not as if the 2T is completely wrong, because like I said, when you taper the plate, essentially to the width, more width, it's code. almost the same. What'd you say? It's still in the code. Well, the code. Yeah, it's still in the code. code. Yeah, yeah. The code simply says you have to have clearance. It yeah, it just says you have to accommodate the end rotation. And, but there's still an example with it. Right. So just in general with the engineers we've worked with, they're finding that the plate can be more compact if it's rectangular. So does that help? Yeah. Anything else? Yep. What about the composite nature of the, uh, the beam of the chevron that receives the chevron? Uh, so I'm really hoping that next year AISC will let us come back and talk about the chevron project. but. Just to let you know, um, what ha that when the beam starts to pull down at really large deformation demands, you get elongation of the um, studs. And so we, it, our recommendations, so we're just finishing a paper um, uh, with the design recommendations in it for submission. Um, but if you're interested, we can, we can send you the information because we've written up um, summaries for AISC. I don't know if they're available. Tom or not the summary report? At this point, I don't know. Okay, Tom doesn't know either, so I'm not sure who would know. But um, but so we aren't we are not relying on composite action there um, in the, in new design. Okay, but with the stiffness may be there that affects the balancing of the chevrons. You're, you're spreading out the uh, balance of tension versus compression because of the definition. The the, so oh, essentially, you won't get that nice balance. Right. So what what happens if you allow the beam to yield? Um, the uh, the demand, the maximum demand in the tension brace is essentially the buckling capacity of the compressive brace. So the compressive brace is limiting how much demand goes into the tension brace. But also, the, the slab itself, if the beam starts to yield, the slab becomes increasingly ineffective. We actually tested 
uh, one frame with the compact. You can see Jerry's face guarding the uh, door. What you happens is you get separation door. after a period of time. Composite it's giving me a mean look. Okay, I've been told, I think I ha we have to go up to. Can you the first slide on the, the PDH? I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. There's another, I thought there was another slide. There. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>